Father, we thank you for this period. Thank you, Lord, because you gathered us together so that you can benefit us and bless us. And then we can be a blessing to the people you have given us to oversee and to take care of and to disciple. We are asking, O oh Lord, that you so bless us and enrich us in your word tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, every one of us without exception will be a blessing to the church, a blessing to outsiders, and will be soul winners that will prepare people for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Good, good headquarters. Amen. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring. We're seeing in verse 15, it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise for in verse 17 then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and everybody said Amen. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26, verse 16. In Acts 26, verse 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things, of this issue that was seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, it says, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, verse 18, it says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Verse 19, wherefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Verse 20, it says, but I have showed first unto them of the, of, unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea that they that then and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Bringing those two passages together, we're looking at earnestly pursuing the heavenly vision in view of the imminent rapture. The Lord is coming again. The rapture is going to take place. The dead in Christ will rise up and we which are alive after those uh, dead people, they rise up, those who sleep in Christ and they go to be with the Lord up in the air. Those who are alive believers, those who are alive, those who have put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be changed. There will be a great miracle of transformation and then will be taken up to be with those people who died and who have been resurrected and who are going to be with the Lord to meet them in the air and 
before that time, we don't know when it will happen. It says no man, no angel, even in heaven knows of the day and the time. Whenever it will take place, between now and then, we're pursuing the heavenly vision. Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It's a mandate, it's a commission given to the whole church, to the pastors, to the ministers, to the preachers, to the teachers, and to the members of the church. That's the heavenly vision. And Paul the apostle received that too. And he said, since I received that I have been pursuing it earnestly, I've been pursuing it wholeheartedly, I've been pursuing it conscientiously, I've been pursuing it preaching to everyone I can get to, and it says, Oh King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision earnestly pursuing the heavenly vision in view of the imminent chapter. Three points we're looking at here. Number one is the urgent thing needful before the immediate condemnation of Sodom. Of Sodom. Now that is Sodom. And it says in Revelation when Jesus was crucified, it calls it spiritually Sodom and the whole world now, the world of sin, the world of corruption, the world of pollution, the world of Sodomites. It calls the world now Sodom. And the condemnation of Sodom is coming and it's going to be immediate. Now the urgent sin that we need to keep doing before that day of condemnation comes upon Sodom, number one, the urgent thing needful before the immediate condemnation of Sodom. Number two, yeah, the urgent task, the urgent task. There are many things we try to get done. We do this and do this and do that, but there, there is one that is urgent. There is one that's so important, so essential. There is one that we have to make number one in our lives. The urgent task necessary before the imminent coming of the Son, our Savior, before He comes, and it is imminent, it is coming, and it will come very soon. There is something we need to concentrate our mind, concentrate our focus, concentrate our talent, concentrate everything we have on the task of winning. Winning the lost unto the Lord, the urgent task necessary before the imminent coming of the Son. Number three, the urgent teaching needed by the immense congregation of saints. The saints of God, very many here, there, in this assembly, in the other assembly, we're not the only believers in the world. We're not the only believers in our nation. We're not the only believers in any nation where we are. We have other believers, all the believers, immense congregation, the urgent teaching that is needed by the immense congregation of saints. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the urgency needful before the immediate condemnation of Sodom. It says in Luke chapter 17, reading here from verse 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lord, they did eat, they, they drank, and they bought, and they sold, and they, and they planted, and they builded. In verse 29, it says, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Look at verse 30. In verse 30, even thus shall it be in the, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It said, it's happened before Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the plains and everywhere round about, the fire came down and destroyed them. But Lord went out first before that fire came on them. It's a picture of the great tribulation that will come only after the saints have gone, the saints have departed, and then there will be the judgment that will come upon 
this world. And he tells us in verse 32, in verse 32 it says, remember Lord's wife, which means it's not automatic. I'm part of the family of Lord's, therefore automatically I'm going to escape the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah. No, there's something still to do. We have to obey the word. We have to give our lives to the Lord. And we need to concentrate the same thing in the congregation today, the same thing in the church today. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said he is coming again. And he makes use of the story of Lord and Sodom and the wife, the whole family. And he said, remember Lord's wife. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, we're looking at the urgency of reaching the wicked before they are forever lost. Number two, the unreadiness of relations and the workers of flimsy lot. Number three, and the urging to remember the wife of fecal lot. Look at number one. Number one is the urgency of reaching the wicked before they are forever lost. Uh, we know the story already. In Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 4. Genesis chapter 19 verse 4, but before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. Uh, these two angels had come and uh, they came to Lord. They wanted to inform Lord that, you know, judgment has come. The end has come for Sodom and Gomorrah. And the, the people of the city, both young and old, they saw, those, they saw those angels. They didn't see the wings of the angels. They didn't see the supernatural power of the angels. They saw them as men. They saw them as handsome men. And because they were Sodomites, they wanted to do the usual thing. Any stranger that comes to town, they will, you know, rough handle them and, you know, kind of impose themselves on them. And they were driven by their loss. They were driven by their flesh. They were driven by sensuality. And so they came. They said, we want to know those men that came. Now look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, and they called unto Lord and said unto him, where are the men which came in to thee this night, bring them out unto us that we may know them. Where adults, let me speak to you in plain language, all those men, young and old, they wanted to take their turn, rough and hold them, rape them. And so, look at verse 6, now the Lord, and Lord went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. In verse 7, verse 7 says, and said, I pray thee, I beg of you, I plead with you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and the men put forth their hand and put Lord into the house to them and shut the door. Verse 11. In verse 11, and he dismissed the men that were at the door with, uh, at the door of the house uh, with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. When those uh, angels miraculously blindfolded them, they became blind. All the same, they were so sensual, they were so driven, that even with that judgment coming upon them, they didn't think. They didn't look back. They were still looking for the door. They wanted to break the door open and still get in and get those angels. We're told in verse 12, in verse 12 it says, And the men said unto Lord, in verse 12, As thou any besides son-in-law and son, thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in this, in the city, bring them out of this place. In verse 13, verse 13 says, for we will destroy this place. 
they've come to the end of their opportunity no more chance to repent the day of grace was finished with them i remember jesus said as it was in the days of lord so shall it be in the day when the son of man shall be revealed there will be people that are sold to sin they're sold to evil they're sold to wickedness they're sold to violence and even when the signs are there that Christ is about to come, they will still continue in their wickedness because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy each. The Lord has given us warning ahead of time. And the Lord has given us the warning to take to the world, to take to your house fellowship, and to take to your souls, and to take to your districts, and to take to all the people you meet, and to take to the man on the street, the woman on the street, to tell everyone that the end is about to come. And we who are in the church, our pastors, our leaders, were to preach with all seriousness, there is, no, there is no chance of playing games. There's no chance of being superficial. When the Lord is at the door, is about to come. You're a worker, you're a pastor, you're a teacher of the word of God. When you teach with all seriousness, because look, the Lord is about to come. And they told Lord, the time has come, we will destroy this place. First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 3. It says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Oh, you said as Paul? Yes, I need to tell you. The words of Paul the Apostle, they were as inspired as any other word in the whole Bible. How do we say that? Because Jesus said, when the Spirit is calm, it will guide you into all truth. Everything Paul said, everything Peter said, everything those apostles said, they were absolute truth coming from the Lord. And the whole scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, what Paul said, what Peter said, what the apostles said, what John said, what Jesus said, everything is part of God and is profitable for doctrine. There is no sentence, there is no word to take away and say, okay, that one is Paul, that one is Peter, everything completely inspired. So the inspired word coming from the Spirit of God through Paul the Apostle says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, and, and tra as travail upon a woman or child, and they shall not escape. All those people at the door wanting to break down the door and uh, commit uh, homosexuality with those angels, all those people, none of them escaped. And it says, the time also is coming, and it's very near. They shall not escape. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it tells us, But ye, brethren, saved, ye, brethren, ready, ye, brethren, prepare to the coming of the Lord, and not in darkness, that that day should take, overtake you as a thief. What shall we be doing now? in the church what should we be doing in ministry in our communities everywhere Colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 in Colossians chapter 1 verse 28 whom we preach 
We should be preaching, not telling stories. We should be preaching and not entertaining people. We should be preaching and not just, you know, having meetings and having gathering. We should be preaching, not just having house fellowship and not just uh, having church meeting. We should be preaching. Who will preach? Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Look at your neighbor. I don't mean your neighbor there. Look at your neighbor. Is he perfect? Look at those at home with you with human eyes. Even the little we can see. Are they perfect? Look at the church, your local church. And look at their actions and reactions. Look at their behavior. And look at the things they do. Are they perfect? And look at our own church, Deep Alive, Bible Church, Day Headquarters, and all the other branches everywhere in every stage, in every nation. Are we perfect? Well, what we should be doing in our church, you and I, is to so preach the word and teach every man to present every man perfect. Present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, uh, those if you if you have a family, those at home, children. Let's say you have six children, and none of them have, they have not taken their baths. They just to go out. That will be a shame to the family. But you, as the father and the mother, you abandon those six children. They're hungry, they're dirty, they're not clothed, and then you're going out everywhere, and you're talking to this, and talking to this, and you're trying to provide water to base or to bath, with, uh, you know, for the outside. And meanwhile, all the children inside, they're not ready, they're not clean enough to go out. The church, as you look at our membership, how ready are we for the rapture? I think uh, this is the time that, you know, both pastor and, you know, the rest of us who are responsible for helping the church to perfect the church, to present a chase virgin unto the Lord. I think this is the time we need to spend more time, more time with the people that we have direct ministry to, direct to overseership to, so that we're not just here and there, here and there, and our primary audience are not ready for the coming of the Lord. I pray we'll be ready in Jesus' name. Let's come to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the unreadiness of relations and workers for of flimsy lodge where well, you understand lodge has been there is separated from Abraham and then he went to pitch his tent near Sodom and he took all his family and he took all his workers the people that were taking care of his cattle he, he could have he could have resigned these people I cannot teach them like Abraham will teach them. I cannot uh, develop them like Abraham, the faithful friend of God, will do. Where would I go? Even if I had a mind to go, what am I looking for? Let me stay with Abraham and tell Abraham whatever problems we have, my uncle, let's resolve it. Because if I take these people away, how do I take care of them? No, he didn't do that. He took all the people that helped him to take care of his cattle and all his family, took them away. The point is now, and the fire is going to descend on Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, all those people you took away, where are they? And where will they spend eternity? My brother there, my sister there. Sometimes in the family, between Lord and Abraham, there may be some discomforting conflict, discussion. And then understand, Abraham is still the older one. 
Abraham is the one that received the call. Abraham is the one that God has been speaking to not once. Before this destruction of, um, of Sodom, did God talk to Lord? He should have listened. Because the message had been coming from God to Abraham and to the rest of the people. Let's always remember that. And whatever we have, money, cattle, people, servants, workers, productions, anything, whatever we have, nothing will replace the grace of God that flows through the message of the Almighty to Abraham and then to the people. Now, he was to go to the people he had taken away from Abraham. Uh, look at um, Genesis chapter 19 uh, verse 14. And Lord went out and spake unto his sons in law, plural, which married his daughters plural and set up get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city if you've never um, quoted scripture to any of your relations if you've never spoken about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to any of your relations, yes, they know you're a Christian. They know you're a believer. And they know you're even not just a believer, you're a deeper life believer. They know that you are a believer who believes in holiness. And they can see the mark on you. But you never talk to them about the deep things of the gospel. And now, one day you rise up. And it's so urgent now because the fire is soon going to come on Sodom and Gomorrah. And you cannot do something gentle, gradual, slow here. You have to just tell it, it's coming. And now he told them, look at it. And it says, but he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. They didn't respond. Maybe, you know, you can influence people from going away from this local church and to go to another place. Maybe you are still here yourself. I used to know one day somebody who remained in the church in deeper life, but he will counsel people to go to that other place, go to that other place. But he himself eventually left. You see, he doesn't pay. He doesn't pay. All these people now, uh, they said, um, Lord, are you joking? We never saw you as serious as this before. Well, eventually, they perished. Our people will not perish. Our workers will not perish. And we're looking at Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore, because of all these things that we see, because of all the events around us we observe, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. In verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by the angels is Sodom and Gomorrah, to Lord, and then he sent him out to go and see his relations and his workers and his, uh, you know, in-laws. For if the word spoken by the angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received, uh, a just recompense of reward. Verse 3, how? Shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If we neglect so great salvation, if we neglect, Abraham believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Lord, why don't you check up how Abraham was justified? 
Lot's wife, why don't you check up how Abraham was justified? And then why don't you pass that on to all your relations and all the workers? But now, when it's becoming too late, too late, too late, that the door of grace was about to close, he ran out and told them, they thought it was joking or jesting. But it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Look at number three. Number three, the urging to remember the wife of fecal lords the urging to remember the wife of fecal lords we're looking at luke chapter 17 verse 32 the angel laid hands on lord and on the wife and on the two daughters they pointed to the mountain top Move on to the mountain top. Where you are is too plain. Where you are is so common. You are the same horizontal level with all the people around. You are the same horizontal level with all the people that are professing, I am saved, I am saved. They profess that they know God, but in works, they deny Him. You are the same horizontal level with everybody in town. You made this one, I am born again. We can't see the evidence. You meet this other one, I am born again, I'm a child of God. We cannot see the evidence. The difference is not clear because they call upon God and they seek God as if they were the people of God. But their lives betray them. And so the angel said, Lord, you've been too close to the people of Sodom. Your life, your disposition, your ambition. And you even want to be like a political leader in Sodom. That's why they said this one fellow came here and wants to rule over us. And wanted to be at the gate. And the angel said, you know, Lord, you're too close in character. You're too close in understanding. There's not much difference between you and them. Move on to the mountain top. And Lord said, oh, my Lord. Don't let me move on to the mountain. I'll be destroyed there. High, higher height of holiness. That will be it, it, I'll have discomfort there. I'm not used to that. Let me go to this place. Okay, we're not going to waste time. Go, go, go. Because we must bring down urgent fire on it. But as we are going, do not look back. Your hear sounds. Do not look back. The fire will be burning. You hear many things cracking. And the fire is burning. Don't look back. You cannot carry all your cattle. You cannot carry everything you have you know, put there in Sodom. You are going empty handed. But all the same, do not look back. The silver and the gold and the cosmetics and everything... You cannot carry anything. And then he had to go. And as he was going, and the two daughters and the wife, the wife obviously was not holding his hand, and he was not holding the wife's hand. I think, uh, you know, they have come to live in such a condition, there's a little bit of independence on each side. Yes, husband and wife, but she was independent of him and he was independent in a way from her. And so she was last at the back. And she knew that Sodom and Gomorrah was burning. Her mind 
our heart was not on the place, the destination they were going. Neither was she heavenly minded. And she looked back and she became a pillar of salt right there. She couldn't get back to Sodom. The whole place is burnt up. She couldn't go forward to higher ground. That was too much for her. Right there, she became a pillar of salt. From the words of Jesus Christ, we learn she didn't also make it to heaven. She did not make it to heaven. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 verse 32 remember Lord's wife. Can I speak to the husbands and want to we should not be fickle in our family. We should not be superficial in our family. We should not be playboys in our families. So that when serious matters come and we talk to our wives, they'll take us serious. When we talk to our relatives, they know we're serious. They know our lives. They watch us. Even the things we think they don't know, they know. We should be so committed to God, so committed to the word of God, that if we have to say anything serious at such a serious time to our wives, she would listen. Wives, can I plead to talk with you that you should, should so live with everyone that interacts with you. That should such a time like this come, and you're the only one that can give them a spiritual warning that they should take care so that they are not lost, your life will carry weight. Your stature will carry weight, and your utterance will carry weight. But if you live in such a way, that, uh, you know, you love them, they love you, you interact, you exchange ideas, and you exchange, you know, whatever you exchange, uh, that they don't take you as a deeply serious, deep alive mother or sister. When such times come like this, they'll not take you serious, they will perish. And so, but Jesus Christ tells us that all those stories we read about in the Old Testament, we shouldn't just say, uh, okay, it's happened to them, it happened to them. We should so take them serious. Remember Lord's wife. We're coming to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at the urgent task necessary before the imminent coming of Christ. He is coming. He is coming. I want you to remember that in his first coming, the prophet said he is coming. He is coming. He is coming. And then the, the end of the Old Testament, Malachi said he will come as a refiner. He will appear in the temple. And then there was silence. It appears maybe he will not come again, but he is coming. And then we're told in Matthew chapter 1 how the angel appeared unto Joseph that what she is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost and she shall bring forth his son and thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. The point is when the, when the prophets announced his first coming now that 400 years between Malachi and Matthew and it appeared God has forgotten about it he will not come again no he will come he came the same thing now the second coming that the Lord himself has announced he will come again he said it in parables he said it in plain language he said it to the disciples he said it to the multitude he will come again and the coming is now imminent our Lord is coming 
our savior is coming and he wants us to be ready that's the urgent task necessary before the imminent coming of the son in luke chapter 12 reading from verse 40 luke chapter 12 verse 40 be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when you think no three things we're looking at here number one prophetic revelation of the rapture at his appearing Number two, personal readiness for the rapture by his ambassadors. Number three, present responsibility until the rapture for his assessment. When he comes, he takes us up. While we're there with him in the air, he will assess what we have done, how we have lived, how we have served, how we have worked, and whether what we have done can have blessing and reward. Look at number one. Number one is the prophetic revelation of the rapture at his appearing and well we already were read uh, first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 14 to verse 17 that assures us he is coming we're looking at first corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 51 behold i show you a mystery a mystery is something that had been hidden and we have not heard about, but the mystery had been there. The message had been there. The event had been there. Only it had not been revealed clearly. Now we need to understand. Paul the Apostle saying, Behold, I, Paul, show you a mystery. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament, Maybe you don't find that thing there. Or you say, how can Paul be saying something that I don't find in the Old Testament? Mystery. And then you go to the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you don't find it in explicit, expressed terms. You say, okay, how can Paul 